Restoring Darkness is brought to you by Devluma, illuminating the pursuit of dark skies. Welcome back to the Restoring Darkness podcast. And today it's my great honor to be joined by Hannah Dalgleish. She's a knowledge exchange professional working in the academic and place-based policy engagement sphere. She has a PhD in astrophysics and has been involved in numerous projects related to astronomy for development, with a particular focus on dark skies and society, light pollution and policy, and science communication. That's interesting, science communication. Hmm. She helps to coordinate the International Astronomical Youth Camp and is a former trustee of the Royal Astronomical Society. For social media, she's on LinkedIn, Twitter, Blue Sky, and has a website. It's hannasdalgleish.com. Um, and then the rest of her stuff, go to restoringdarkness.com, and we'll have links to all that stuff on there on the page. But while you're there, why not consider donating to the Lighting and Darkness Foundation? We do education, we help people with lighting ordinance battles, um, and we're trying to convince the lighting industry to embrace the darkness restoration and night preservation movement. So go to restoringdarkness.com and you can click the donate. Why not become a monthly donor? Um, really, everybody has their way of giving back and sometimes it's just with cash and we're okay with that. So hopefully you are too, all you listeners out there. Also, if you want to give directly to a, uh, a campaign, you can help out the good folks in Wasatch Back County. That's right, in Utah, they're in the midst of a massive lighting ordinance battle there. And so you can click Darkness Campaigns and donate directly to their campaign. So go to restoringdarkness.com. Welcome to the podcast, Anna. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I want to ask you right off the bat, just a, just a couple of things. Um, what is place-based policy? What is that? Good question. So I don't know if it's happening internationally, but definitely in the UK, there's a big um, movement towards place-based impact, place-based research. And I think what's been happening a lot in the past is that we've kind of been looking at national networks and national projects um, or international projects. And what we found is that, that that doesn't really work for people in more local contexts. Mm. So that it's a lot better to find solutions and to work people on with people on smaller scales, whether that's um, a particular city or, or a region. Um, and so, for example, you know, Scotland gets to make some of its own decisions rather than um, having to do everything that England or London does. And that works better for Scotland because they have different issues and different challenges to deal with. So this kind of place based angle is more at, for me, uh, is more in the context of Southampton and other cities nearby and looking at this region called the Central South and trying to address local challenges here using kind of evidence and research to inform that. Hmm. I, I think it's probably more uh, important in the UK because of the process of devolution and the weakness of local governments in the UK it seems to be a problem. I've you know read articles in The Economist about, uh, you know, giving, uh, I, can, I don't know what you call your municipalities, there's a different word for it, but um, uh, councils, I think they're called, um, more yeah. power over you know the streets instead of having to go to london which you know england's not a big country geographically but certainly there's big differences in various regions and so i think it's probably more of an acute issue in the uk than it, it is in in canada although i think that you know for example water policy is probably better handled locally in many respects um, and then with your local partners on the great lakes or whatever there's a lot of different things that's interesting that it's called place-based huh um, tell me about science communication. Is that where you are engaging the public or trying to tell the public this is what we know? Yeah, science communication I was doing a lot of during my PhD um, while I was doing astrophysics. And that 
kind of involved doing more than just outreach and kind of really getting to know your audience, really trying to spend time with them, um, thinking about long term projects that you're working with people that may not necessarily have a scientific background and kind of understanding the science behind science communication is really important as well. Who are your demographics? Mm. Who are um, what are their backgrounds? How are you making it accessible depending on their needs and limitations? And so it's kind of, it can also be a two way exchange of knowledge and, and science and sharing so that I'm getting just as much out of it as the people that I'm working with. So, I mean, one really good example of that is the astronomy camp that you mentioned in the bio. And um, that kind of involves that's a three week summer camp where kids come from, well, young people, 16 to 25, come together from all over the world. And you work together to, to do projects from the ground up. And it's not it's not teaching and it's not outreach because you're really working with them one on one and you're really working from the from the ground up and doing a lot of skills and exploration and and more in-depth kind of projects if that makes sense Mm -hmm. you you mentioned the two-way communication piece and i was um i can't remember where i heard this but it, it kind of blew my mind this one researcher was talking about how one plus one used to equal one until she was talking to a crowd of of i don't know what it where it was but then one kid stood up and said, I have two pieces of chewing gum. One plus one equals one because now I have one. And took the two pieces and put them together and put them in his, in his mouth or whatever and started chewing. This is one piece of chewing gum now. And I thought that was super interesting the way that the, the child was able to communicate, you know, a different way of looking at the world. And I think it's important that it be two way. What is it that you, that, but what is it that an astrophysicist wants to communicate? What what is it that you want to tell the the public, especially as it relates to light pollution and dark skies, night preservation, society? What are you trying to communicate? Yeah, that's always been a question that I've asked myself over many, many years. And I think a lot of astronomers ask themselves um, because it's more than just the science. Mm -hmm. Um, You spend your time looking at data, looking at numbers, and making plots and trying to figure out what is going on in this image or data that you're looking at um Mm. and whether that might be for example oh a galaxy is kind of going in this direction or a star has this kind of chemistry um how do i compare it to this other kind of star does that is that in alignment with the physics that we already know and understand and expect to happen or is it is something different going on Um, But then beyond that, we kind of question, okay, well, what is the purpose of of kind of doing this? And, and often astronomers will say, yeah, it's for, it's for knowledge, it's for truth, it's for kind of learning and and understanding the awesomeness of the universe. Um, And then I was interested in taking it even further and thinking about how can we make astronomy even more relevant for society where does astronomy and society come together and that kind of led me to sustainable development and thinking of okay well you can use astronomy as a tool for education um, to get young people interested in science Um, astronomy is often referred to as being a gateway science Um, Then there's other more kind of technical applications. So a lot of the um, really advanced imaging that is required to do astronomy, often Mm. that ends up being used in medicine, um, for example, and and cool Mm. things like that. And then I was interested also in how sort of nature and society and the environment can come into it as well. So then that led me to to dark skies and light pollution. And so that seemed a very clear way to kind of share astronomers passion for being able to experience and enjoy a dark night sky, which is actually 
essential if they want to be able to do science mm -hmm. and do the research that we need to do. Um, but then also add another dimension to it in terms of, well, actually, it's benefiting the environment, it's benefiting human health, it's benefiting sort of even our cultural heritage by by conserving and preserving these dark skies. You mentioned that um, as, uh, you know, astrophysics and that is a gateway. You know, I, it, to me, um, it seems like understanding the cosmos is, 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 is fundamental and changes in those understandings usher in new epochs. So when, I don't know if it was Copernicus or Galileo said, you know, the sun is at the center of the universe, not the earth. And they, you know, I, you can put yourself in, you know, in the, in the Rome in whatever the 1500s and sit down, Pope, I got to tell you something here, Right. We actually go around the sun. No, I see the sun going around the earth every day. You know, what about the moon? No, the moon goes around the earth, though. Like, you could see how conceptually, how difficult this would be to land, right? Um, and I spoke to another scientist, and, and she explained that they figured it out because the math didn't work until the earth revolved around the sun. Once they had the earth revolving around the sun, then all of a sudden the celestial patterns made a lot more sense to them. And this ushered in the scientific revolution. You know, this understanding, um, it, was, it was an epoch. It shifted our entire consciousness. So I, I do think that, uh, you know, but do people really have access to this information? And how can we get more access to it, Hannah? You mean the general public? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think accessibility is really difficult and i was reading an article this morning actually about scientific literacy and how in some ways how problematic that term is because we're kind of saying well people are scientifically illiterate by saying that other people are scientifically literate and that is quite exclusionary and derogatory to a lot of people and that if we want people to have a better understanding of the scientific method and those concepts of how and why the earth goes around the sun and why Pluto is or isn't a planet and, mm. and these kind of interesting things or often the most common question I get is probably around black holes and I know nothing about black holes so do not ask me about black yeah. holes. Um, but um I think you've got to tap into to that curiosity um, and to and also embrace kind of more arts and humanities and cultural and, and stories. And I think that's one of the things that science often has struggled with is is forgetting that there is always a story. There's a human, there's this human aspect behind what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and that's something that's kind of seems to be coming out more currently is to embrace that the stories to make it more um accessible to to the general public and and there are much more kind of creative projects that i see being done where artists are not so afraid of say working together with astronomers or mm. um these I think that not that they were afraid in the past, but it seems to be, or maybe there's just more funding available to do these kind of projects where perhaps they weren't um, so available before. It's almost like you, when I listen to you, you're talking about marketing the wonders of astrophysics to the public, or you're like a marketing department or something like that. And so you need artists <laughs> and the same as a marketing department, when you're reaching out to different skill sets to help you unpack some of these more complicated ideas and make them sim you know i mean maybe the word mature scientifically mature is a better word than than literate um but i you know if something is really complex it's probably not that well understood you know if something is you know complex beyond the average human's you know graduate of university or high school or whatever to really understand the concept of it probably isn't understood that well so you know, is that what you're doing? Are you marketing astrophysics? Are you trying to come up with um, terminology and themes that help people understand these complex uh, topics? Um, yeah, I guess 
often what I've been interested in doing is more trying to fill in the gap of of that human and societal and cultural aspects. So I don't necessarily I leave it to other people to ensure that the future of astronomy is is catered for because that's a whole thing in itself and actually how do you go to the government right and you say i need funding to build this telescope it's going to cost billions mm. um and they want to say well what's the impact what how who is that going to benefit how is it going to benefit society um and somehow astronomers do manage to get that funding to but often it's dependent on collaboration Mm. Uh, one country one country doesn't really have the funding to do it alone but if you collaborate with countries all over the world they will then have access to bigger pools of money or or resources and in-kind contributions in order to actually be able to fund and build these telescopes so then i'm kind of interested in what happens afterwards like what how can we actually build these observatories to have a societal impact how does it how can it build capacity it, so that's something that was especially um that i was focusing on in africa and namibia i spent some time there and um so for example you could build a telescope in the global south using money from the global north and you could ship people from the global north to go and operate this telescope and they would send all the data back to them and it wouldn't really benefit people in in Africa for example whatsoever because um but whereas on the other hand you could do it differently you could say okay i'm going to we're going to build an observatory in the global south and the reason why this happens is because that's where the dark skies are we've kind of now polluted the skies uh, completely almost completely in the global north so there's not really good access to to dark skies and so you could think about okay i'm going to build an observatory in africa but I want it to actually benefit people there. So I'm going to implement a training program which happens long in advance before the telescope has even finished construction so that by the time the telescope is ready to go, there are local people there who are able to work on the observatory, are able to maintain it and do the engineering, um, and also to do research and have PhD students and master's students and you're building that capacity locally so that it doesn't just benefit the rich white people who who have funded and, and built this telescope so that it's not just for them but it it's for the people whose land we're actually using as well so have you built one of these yet have you executed <laughs> one of these projects no. yet? um so i've kind of been involved here and there i've had kind of quite a lot of short-term contracts over over the years so i kind of the other challenge with these things is, is funding is difficult so it's hard to have a position that's actually sustainable and long term so i kind of end up doing something over here for six months and then going over here for three months and working on that so it's difficult for me to to kind of execute these things on a large scale but I end up developing the networks and developing the contacts with the people who are pulling strings, perhaps, or, you know, give, I give talks at conferences to, to try and encourage people to think about these societal impacts um, outside of just the astronomy so that there's more awareness about it and more benefit to, to people. Now, that's what you're calling astronomy for development. Or is that something? Yeah, different? that's one big okay. aspect. So we, you yeah, want to? So, yep. Um, yeah. So astronomy for development basically involves looking at the sustainable development goals. This is one way you could do it, and trying to identify ways that astronomy can benefit each of those different sustainable development goals. Um, there is an office 
for the for of astronomy for development and they're based in Cape Town in South Africa and they come under the International Astronomical Union so I've kind of done some work collaborating with them as well they are the ones that kind of initiated and inspired this I think more than yeah quite a while ago now more than a decade ago can you give me some examples of some of their successful projects and how they've been able to uh, use astronomy as a, a, a development tool? Yeah, there must be hundreds by now. But um, the first one that comes to mind that I really love is called the Astro Stays Project. Mm -hmm. And that was, so So every year the, the OAD has a funding call for up to, I think 15,000 euros where people can apply for money to get started with a project that's related to astronomy and comes under the sustainable development context. And so this project called Astro Stays um, came from the Himalayas in India. And the idea was to train local women in remote villages to learn some basic astronomy knowledge and how to use telescopes to then start a sort of dark sky astro tourism um, ventures. And it's just been a really great success. I think mm. they've trained um, 40 or more women. Um, and often as well, the women in those kind of communities often wouldn't get to be involved with these kind of projects or, or be in charge of, of leading um, these sort of community roles that that happen there. Um, and so, yeah, I think now they've had in the region of thousands of tourists coming to see them and stay with them. And often they're put up in, in people's homes and often they are kind of given a whole experience is not just the astronomy there's also gastronomy involved so having some local food and and things like that so and and then of course the cultural maybe also indigenous stories that are local to the region um but what's what i love about these stories and projects is that it's about giving the ownership and, and enabling the community to do these things. It's not about coming in as an outsider, which often happens. Um, and I'll do a project for a weekend and organize in a, some astronomy tourism event, and then I leave and then that knowledge is gone, right? So how mm. do you actually start from the ground up to, to give the ownership over to local people? And so this is a way for them to earn income as well, I suppose, where they're they're sort of charging for these tours or uh, to stargaze and to look through uh, telescopes at the uh, night sky. And being in the Himalayas is very um, helpful with uh, that type of thing. That's that's a. Um, and when you have you encountered some of these folks in these areas? Have you have you been involved in any of, uh, of these projects that are in you know some uh, some areas like this? And if yes, how do they feel about night preservation and, and darkness restoration in these communities? Yeah, so I had one key experience that I remember while I was in Namibia. So part of my role in Namibia was to look at dark sky tourism to try and kind of create awareness around the opportunity in Namibia for dark skies because they have such a huge country and not so many people living in it. So it's um, got very low density in terms of the population and really amazing dark skies and, and mostly a lot of it is just desert, right? So we were trying to create awareness with the people say in the tourism industry and also in higher up um, in the ministry for tourism and things like that. And then also from the ground up, so trying to talk to tour guides, trying to engage with them and see if they would be interested in learning some astronomy to then enable them to run their own sort of tourism endeavors 
in relation to astronomy because actually I was surprised when I sort of traveled a bit as a tourist myself in Namibia they were not really they were not taking advantage of nighttime tourism activities there were often mm. only activities during the day um and it seemed and, and a lot of these really remote um lodges that I stayed in they actually had quite a lot of lighting so it also seemed like a massive um opportunity lost by by lighting up these beautiful remote areas so one of the things we did was to try and develop um an astronomy course astronomy and astro tourism course for which was kind of aimed at tour guides in Namibia but we delivered it online because it was during the pandemic and so we had people coming from all over the world participating in this course and yeah it kind of included all sorts of different things it included some of the astronomy facts and and interesting figures and things but then also the the kind of the telescopes in south africa and namibia and the impact that they've had um and the benefits to the local people and then also some stuff around light pollution and the harms of light pollution on the environment and those aspects as well and then the other important thing was trying to uncover some of the indigenous stories so one of the things that i loved apart about my time there was i visited um this place called sumkwe and there are san people living there and i went with some other colleagues and we kind of started to ask them questions about would they be interested in doing some dark sky tourism but also what is their relationship with the night sky and there it was very dark and they have amazing skies um and whether or not they know and remember the stories and so what was really a big surprise was to learn that only one person in their entire community of i don't know i think around 2000 people only one person had remembered any of the stories around the stars in their tradition and so that was a shock and was also very sad because obviously when this person goes then is that knowledge going to be completely lost altogether and also just thinking about the thousands of other indigenous communities which may be in a similar similar situation and also losing these stories that we have about the night sky and the stars um which is really quite tragic so i see tourism as a as an opportunity and as a way to actually help try and preserve these stories as well as being benefits for for the economy and things like that. Hmm. That is sad, you know, but part of me wonders whether, you know, one of the things that um that's striking about what you're saying is that I'm not sure I I I totally understand is that there's a difference between going to another place so you talked about this place based stuff and um building an observatory and using the information for scientific purposes and then instead going there with the intent of involving the local community in this particular project but in a way it almost strikes me as that those two things are very similar you know how do you how do we know that our interventions just aren't always bad <laughs> you you understand what i'm saying like there's there's an intervening the bo- they're both interventions that's what i'm saying you know yeah. what i mean and you're sad that this community yeah. has lost their stories or whatever but maybe you should find your own stories in britain i don't you know what i'm saying like i'm playing devil's advocate to your argument cuz i actually think it's great but is there an element of that where we just need to stop intervening in other people's affairs like is there something there that we, maybe we should you know um maybe we should you know be guests rather than you know hey we got a great idea here's a telescope here's this here's let me train you on this and maybe those people are volunteering but there's an interventionist there's an interventionism to this that 
after what all of you've said, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with totally. You, do, do you understand what I'm getting at? No, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for saying that because that is something I question myself every day, you know, especially as, as this white British person coming to Namibia and saying, oh, look, I have all this knowledge <laughs> and I'm going to do all these things. Um, but I felt that it should be them leading and not me, right? So... I think, yeah, I think it's always, always difficult. I even, I wrote a blog about this a while ago, um, like the privilege of being an astronomer and the conflict that I had of my role there in Namibia and, and that I felt, yeah, like it perhaps wasn't my place to be doing what I was doing, but at the same time, um, it was a great privilege to be able to, to do the things that I did and learn from all these incredible people. So, yeah, I think it comes down to trying to bridge these gaps with the North and the South together mm. and to give everyone an equal share or equal stake at the table so that it's not, it's not hierarchical and it's not, kind of like we've got the money and we've got the resources um, and we want to do this. So you've got no choice but to sort of tag along because you need those money, that money and those resources. Um, so how do we change that dynamic so that it's actually, say, for example, the African Union saying, okay, we actually want this. We want to prepare for the fourth industrial revolution. We want to have... Um, technology that we can use we want to have amazing infrastructure and observatories and that it's coming from them and that they're saying um and also that they're contributing as well in some way because another thing that i found from doing some research on this is that projects are much more successful if everyone sort of buys into them and sure. it's not um the other way around and so yeah, that was kind of, I guess, the conclusion that I came to. And and what I do love is that the Office of Astronomy for Development, the OAD, they are based in Cape Town. They are driven by, a lot of them by sort of South Africans and local people. So it isn't something that is coming from the global north and, and sort of separate or, or hierarchical um so and they're always and actually there was such an eagerness and such a beautiful willingness willingness to work for people to work together and for for learning and people were always so much more um thirsty for knowledge mm. especially um yeah, compared to a lot of experiences I've had during sort of science communication in, in the global north, for example. You know, so I, I would say that, you know, and again, um, I look at these, like I what I see when I look at the world, and I love what you're doing, by the way. I think it's fantastic, and obviously I'm a night preservation advocate. But we've had other people on the show where it's, it's difficult for us to tell people they shouldn't have light pollution when we're totally light polluted. Um, you know, and, and, you know, it, not to say that they're less sophisticated than we are or whatever, or that I know more than other people or anything like that. But I, you know, I, I have done a lot of podcasts on lighting <laughs> and on light pollution and I know it's bad and I know we can fix it. Um, but you know, there's an element to these interventions that I see around the world where I'm never comfortable. I don't care if it's, you know, Mali in Africa with the French and the uranium or Ukraine war. Whenever I get this information about interventions or we're building a railroad or whatever they're doing um, in these countries, I'm always suspicious of the spin. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm you know... Oh, you know, go Ukraine or, you know, whatever. Putin's an evil maniacal and all this kind of messaging that you receive about this intervention. You know, I'm not so sure that, you know, that, that, that it's unsullied information. You know, there's oftentimes, you know, we're doing this for this reason or that. And it's, I, I love the fact that you're, you're, you're questioning it all the time. 
Whereas I don't think there's enough questioning of the inf- interventions. And sometimes you're not even allowed to question it. You know, that's another thing that is, you know, um, uh, you know, interesting to like. And, you know, I know this is a very controversial issue, but maybe the Ukrainians and the Russians have something they need to work out that we don't need to be involved in. You, you understand what I, like maybe the people in Namibia or Ethiopia or these other places, maybe they don't need us, you know. Um, regardless of how much we know about whatever. <laughs> it usually ends up that, hey, there's a lot of cobalt in your country. Um, do you want to help us dig it up? Sure. You know, hey, and yeah. it's going to be yeah. sustainable and we're going to make phones and electric cars with it. Or It never seems, to, and, and not that I'm, I just, I agree with your hesitancy and your humility with regard to this because I don't see a lot of it whenever it comes to any intervention. I see like it's like a marketing program of how to convince everyone of this, that this is good. Co- cobalt in the Congo is good. You know, um, lithium mm-hmm. mines in Chile are good. You know, and it's like, don't question it. You're not allowed to say anything about it. Don't ask any questions about Starling that. satellites are good. <laughs> yes. Yes. You know what, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? And I, I'm, I'm very concerned when someone says that you can't, you can't question that. Why can't I know more about it or what, yeah. what's, yeah, so. I, agree I think one of the great things about astronomy is, and often with astronomers, is that it's quite hard to have a political agenda mm. because there's not really an economic benefit in the huge amount to, to doing astronomy, to building observatories and putting them in space. Um, and so, it's had to be driven by the actual kind of root interest and awe and inspiration and and often doesn't have that twist that that you see a lot with other projects and with wanting resources and and these kind of things so i think that's one of the things that i find really beautiful and special about astronomy yeah and in itself as a science and and it's uh, it's a human universal. All cultures have stories about the heavens and how they relate to their lives and 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 what they why they matter. And I I've often wondered if these are more important than just stories, and that there's something to our cultural, you know, have cultural evolution is is a phrase that you can use, or there's yeah. something fundamental about seeing the Milky Way about seeing the stars, about under, um, trying to figure them out in whatever cultural way you're doing it, from where, where, where you're at, whether that's a, you know someone living in Toronto, Canada, or in the Hamptons in England, and just being uh, mindful of an enormous universe filled with stars on a rock that's spinning around a nuclear fission reactor at whatever thousands of millions of kilometers an hour. All these numbers are... Are, you know, there's an element of the sublime that's almost um, de- de- like a deity that you can get into it and in a way really be humbled. And I, 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 mm-hmm. I love the way that you're promoting it with a sense of, not with a hammer, everything's a nail, but with a sense of wonder. I think it's very important. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I find really sad about light pollution is that so many people are now growing up today without ever having used their night vision or never having seen the Milky Way and and people who perhaps see it for the first time because there's a blackout or something and mm. they literally have no idea what they're they looking at. They think it's smoke. And... They think it's smoke. <laughs> yeah. I'm not kidding yeah. you. Call the police. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah, think something's yeah, yeah. on fire. Um, you know, the yeah. prob- one of the problems with, you know, the way humans interact with their environment is that like everything is given a time frame and if nothing happens within a certain time frame, it means it's okay. Right. And light pollution is so creeping and slow. And one of the reasons why that it has, um, accelerated into our consciousnesses today is because we just went through a lighting led revolution which made light pollution way worse really quickly so Mm -hmm. in a in a period of five or six years a period of somebody's 
you know, a decade of someone's life, massive areas of star gazing were eliminated for them. And I can see this at my own, my, my own father-in-law's cottage where we can see on the southern, uh, southwestern horizon that you can no longer see the stars there because they've changed a lot of the lights in the small town to LED over there and you can see the, the sky glow. So we've seen them. That's why I became so passionate about it because there was this event that mm. it wasn't creeping enough that I didn't notice it. I noticed it. And so I started this podcast and other things like that. It's the same thing with hazardous waste, okay. you know. Groundwater moves at like seven feet a year or something like that in the ground. I can't remember what the metric is, but actually really slowly, right? So if you have a, you know, there's a dump in, near where my house is where there was a toxic waste dump and what's going on up there? Like, is it like, is the waste creeping through the water? We, we, we can't, uh, we can't work outside of a certain time frame sometimes. And these things catch up with us. Light pollution is one of those things that has just grown immensely. Um, since the 1950s. And now we have two generations of people that probably have never seen the Milky Way. Yeah. And think of all the people that were inspired by the Milky Way to, to do great and wonderful things, right? And whether they decided to become scientists or, you know, whether they were scientists who were trying to solve this major conundrum and would go off to a remote place in nature and just experience and, and be at peace and, and have ideas come to them in a different way than we do now today when everything is just so constantly on a screen all the time, mm -hmm. connected to emails 100% of the time. And there's no time for creativity or being disconnected or um, really enjoying nature i think in the way that all, all of our ancestors used to used to have and do um and i think that yeah it's a great loss yeah there's a, it's almost like there's the the tranquility has been robbed from us in some way by i mean um marshall McLuhan says you know first we shape technology then technology shapes us um you know but when i you yeah i, I watch these archaeological shows all the time okay like on Netflix or whatever, something about, you know, I remember watching one recently. I, you know, I don't absorb much of it. It's entertainment. But I remember watching this one um, in Malta. These They had or Malta or is it Corsica? One of the islands in the Mediterranean. This culture had built all these different structures and they couldn't figure out why they kept building this one temple. And then it came out that they're aligning with a star that wobbles a little bit. And so this star is special to them. And so every time the star moves, they got to build an entirely new temple so that the star aligns perfectly with the entrance of the temple. And you have the period, the Giza pyramids, the center uh, pyramid aligns with the middle belt of uh, Orion's belt or something crazy like that every period of time. And we have this um, architecture, historical architectural relationship between the buildings we've built in the past and the heavens. and People are saying that this our, our ancestors are screaming at us through archaeology that this the stars are so important. Yet we don't think they are. Yeah, and how do we how do we get people to rediscover that? That's that's the question. That's or your how job. How do we get people to care? Yeah. That's your job. <laughs> Ah. Yeah, I took some people on a night walk um, a couple of weekends ago and, yeah, just asked them the question, you know, when was the last time you were properly in a place in complete darkness without any lights and and what do you feel being in this situation? If you were alone, do you think you would be afraid? And just getting people to think about it because I think that's the main thing is that nobody thinks about the night or their experience in the night they just think about trying to get from a to b as quickly as possible um because that's what we do now um and and i think as well a lot of the current thinking around you know health and well-being and conservation and rewilding and earth day and all of these now immense things telling us that nature is good for us and whatever mm. that is all from a day centric 
point of view and I don't see nighttime natural darkness I don't see that mentioned or included in any of these programs anywhere you know like forest bathing is another example so how do we get those you know organizations and and researchers and all sorts of um and even governmental bodies and environmental agencies to to think and include half of our lives you know half of the years mm. half of the earth's time in the year is in darkness so but we just forget that, that it exists or it's important well i think you know i think i may be able to answer that maybe maybe not so great <laughs> uh, hu humans are and the, he's going to throw a pencil at me because i've said this so many times on the show but and he, he's going to the producer, humans are not a nocturnal species <laughs> right like oftentimes we don't look at ourselves zoologically right? Like we're a, a, a diurnal species, right? So everything naturally for us is about blotting out darkness so we can continue to see as if it was daytime. But in that um, is a fallacy that darkness is not equal to light. Like that's why it's the lighting and darkness foundation. It's not the lighting foundation. You know, we need to change the industry, the lighting industry from the the, the, the lighting is the asset we're providing to lighting and darkness is the assets that we're, we provide for people, right? And that darkness mm. is, is as important, is equal, is of equal importance to the electric light we're providing people. And, and so this idea, like, for example, um, there's a, let me, I'd love your thoughts on this, actually. This is an interesting, because you're going to, you're going to give me a different angle on it, I'm sure. Um. The lighting industry is obsessed with the ability of electric light to create positive health impacts, okay? So now there is evidence that, you know, using infrared can help cure things. And, you know, there is some seasonal effective information and there is some, there is some research on circadian rhythms and all this kind of thing, right? Um, and so there's this quest to find the healthy light bulb. But what I've discovered in many hundreds of lighting episodes on the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast and this show and other shows where I, where I host and talk to people, what I found is that we're starting from the wrong premise. Every type of lighting should be evaluated not for any health benefits it might create, but for the harms it's going to create, that it will create yeah, you, you understand what I'm saying? Like we're evaluating it based on assuming it's always good. And then what could, more good does it do? Can we improve productivity? If we shine people with all this lux, will it make them more productive? And so these researchers find the answers they're looking for. But embedded in all of that is a lot of damage. There's a lot of things that lighting does that pollutes, that causes trouble for animals, causes, wrecks people's circadian rhythm, um, you know, all these other things. Why is it that the default from the lighting industry, and, and you're a scientist, so is, is it because we're axiomatically and have a presupposition that light, electric light is always good? And we need to change that to it's benign and we need to observe it as, for its pros and cons. It's almost like light is always good, more light equals more safety, and it's not pollution. Light pollution is just a metaphor. It's not really actually pollution. But we need to t change that to assume that any light is a form of pollution, just like using electricity generates carbon emissions or whatever, what have you, right? How can we, we need to change that focus to be more balanced. Would you agree with that? And, and why is that? And can you answer that question? Um, it's a big question. Yeah, the thing that comes to my mind is that we need to be looking more at darkness therapy right we need mm. to be making darkness more positive and looking at the benefits of darkness rather than saying um rather than just talking about light as a positive or a negative um thing that we use but that focus on that darkness as well and i think Looking at examples, um, I recently wrote an article for the Bashara magazine, which was about kind of the spirituality around the night and darkness. And 
that was really interesting to to look at and do research on because I hadn't come across this before in mm. the sort of dark sky world. And there are many traditions throughout time that really embrace darkness as a really kind of wholesome and holistic process of their spiritual journey. So, for example, there are people that go on dark retreats where essentially you just sit in darkness for a number of hours or days or even weeks if you're incredibly experienced. Um, and that's a way for them to come become closer to themselves or closer to their God or, or whatever. Um, and I've heard and come across in other traditions as well, there's um, kind of in Sufism, they find that the night is a very sacred and special time and it and it offers closeness again to ourselves and to the universe and so on and so i think that is perhaps one way that we can start to because i think in the more traditional say christianity or whatever that's often been more about light over dark and we must conquer darkness and dark yeah christ is the light of the world yeah yeah so i think actually that uh, stereotype or cultural kind of implications has resulted into where we are today in terms of oh we now have the technology to have light all the time and this mm -hmm. must be a good thing because i've been growing brought up in a society that believes that light is the savior for all of humankind. Um, so maybe like if there ever, if it. there was a metaphor, that's a metaphor. Okay. It's a religious metaphor mm. to say, you know, it Possibly. doesn't mean that we should electrically light our entire self until we no longer can see the heavens themselves. Right. I mean, they, I'll, exactly. I'll give you an example. What's happening in Wasatch back is there's a religious community there that wants to build a temple okay and uplight it because they believe that the temple is the place where god and the and and earth and the heavens connect except they want to blot out the heavens with their uplight like if they can't see how ridiculous that is i i don't know if we can help them y you understand what i'm talking about <laughs> Like, I don't yeah. care if it's a mosque. So it's I'm a Catholic. Happened. I don't care if it's a mosque, a Catholic church, whatever it is. It's like, that's ridiculous to say that. That is so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to see how ridiculous that mm -hmm. is, don't you? Like, that's really crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, yeah. I, there's, a, there's this, there, the, the, what, I, what I've, I've often advocated for in this show and within the Lighting and Darkness Foundation is that darkness has to be brought to the table as an equal partner in everything yeah. we do. And that's not happening. Everything's about balance. Well, no, you, we don't have any balance. If you go to the IES, it's about balancing, human safety. No, 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 no. There is no balance. We're, what I'm calling for is balance. That's what I'm calling for. If you say, no, no, we need to be able to light pollute. Well, what? Why? We have the technology. We have the controls. We have all the capabilities to reduce it by 90%. Let's do that. No. I, you know, I, I, it's a difficult issue. One of the things that, and you brought it up a little earlier, it's it, the environmentalists also don't consider light pollution pollution. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. <laughs> if you don't have them on board, then how can we get anyone else on board? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I mean, nothing would contribute to climate change as a mitigation better than uh, restoring darkness to the world and, and implementing all this energy efficient equipment with cutoff and lower light levels mm -hmm. and all that would be a fantastic mitigation. Mm -hmm. I feel like I could talk to yeah. you forever, Hannah. Such a <laughs> <laughs> low hanging fruit as well. Yeah. For sure. And it seems ridiculous to not go for it. Yeah. Do you have any um, final thoughts? We've gone for 53 minutes, if you can believe it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been fun. Um, mm. And I. Yeah, it's always, it's a pleasure to be able to discuss with other people who especially know a lot about light pollution and dark skies, but be able to think more about, yeah, those cultural aspects and, mm. and where, where do we go from here, I guess, is what I'm curious about. And 
because in my actual job right now I don't really get to do much stuff on light pollution or dark skies anymore mm. um, so I try and squeeze it in wherever I can um, but you know we have all these great organizations especially for example the IDA International Dark Sky Association oh they're now dark sky aren't they mm. uh, no longer IDA um, and we have, you know, all these chapters in different countries all over, but there's still, there's not really any policies. There's not really any awareness. There's not most of the general public that I talk to will not really know anything about light pollution or have ever considered it or thought about it. People are using lighting more and more and to light up their gardens and, um, so something has to change and it has to happen very soon. And I don't know, we need to, I guess there needs to be something huge, some really big event or really big awareness driven um, project so that it's on the minds of the general public and of our politicians and policy makers, because it's kind of stuck in a, in a cycle in terms of, well, policymakers don't want to do anything about it because the general public aren't asking for it and they're not aware of it, but they're also not aware of it because um, policymakers and politicians aren't talking about it. So I'm kind of curious about and don't have the answers to where the point is at where this can change. Um, and perhaps from history, there are useful examples. I was looking a little bit into air pollution and the story around, especially in um, Manchester with local groups trying to say, this pollution is really bad. You know, we're dying. We can't breathe. We can't see. Um, but even the progress there was very, very slow. Um, and yeah, I'm mostly just rambling, but um, yeah, I would love to for people to maybe try and think about what the answer is to that. Like, how do we actually shift this situation into becoming something where everyone does know about it? Everyone is talking about it. People want to go and experience and see the stars and see the Milky Way um, and shift this perspective radically, which we, we need to do. So I'm going to answer Hannah's questions for you folks all of you listening out there the lighting industry needs to get on board with this and guess what lighting industry guess what darkness restoration and night preservation means more light fixtures that's always what it means more light fixtures less light output under lighting controls you're interested in lighting controls darkness restoration municipal street lighting outdoor lighting is the number one application for lighting controls and nobody's working on it right now so the if you want to solve what we're trying to do with the lighting and darkness foundation folks is we're trying to bring the lighting industry into the equation by creating training for lighting professionals frontline lighting practitioners we're working on our darkness specialist one program which is going to complement our lighting specialist one program Right, so every time we create a program, it's going to be a lighting program. We're going to match it with the darkness program. So DS1 should be coming out in 2023. Um, you can get that at nail.org. And if you want to support that kind of work, you go to restoringdarkness.com right now. Click the donate link. Why not donate to the Lighting and Darkness Foundation? Um, if you feel like you want to be charitable or volunteer, we need volunteers. That's right. We need people to help us out, and we're looking for an executive director. So if you're in the United States, you need to be in the United States to be the executive director of the Lighting and Darkness Foundation. If you're there and you want to help us out, go to restoringdarkness.com and contact us. And also, Darkness Campaigns, if you want to help with the folks in Wasatch Valley, or you need help from the Lighting and Darkness Foundation with your municipal lighting ordinance problems, contact us. We're here for you guys. We want to thank Hannah. I'm going to try to do your last name again. I got it at the beginning. Dalglish. Hannah Dalglish. Um <laughs> You can check out our website. All our social media is on the Restoring Darkness podcast website. Thank you for listening. Look no further for dark sky friendly products than Evluma. Since its first product launch, Evluma has carried one or more International Dark Sky Association certified models. If your customer cares about light pollution, suggest the Omnimax with shielding or the Area Max with full cutoff to reduce uplight and glare. 
Evluma, illuminating the pursuit of darkness.